Thank you very much, Larry. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, a huge vote of thanks to uh, to uh, Matthew and all the staff at, at uh, BFI. I mean, I'm reminded of a quote from Gerard Manley Hopkins, which is, uh, sheer plod makes uh, what sheer plod makes plough down silly and shine. And all I wanted to say here was there's a hell of a lot of hard graft gone into creating this shiny example of what can be done when you get the data right and you process it right. But there's a huge amount of effort gone into this and we should all recognise that. Um, and I want to say a bit more about why it's so important that this has been done. Um, because for us, uh, if, you know, for many years, northern uh, NGOs like Oxfam have been, uh, have been criticised, often quite rightly, for doing a lot of criticism of, of donors, a lot of criticism of, of IFIs, and yet also pulling our punches and, uh, and pulling in our horns when it's a matter of criticising the perv some often perverse decisions by developing country governments regarding the allocation of their own uh, budgets and their own policies. And so this, I think, has been changing over the last five to eight years. Sorry, and I'll change the slide <laughs> as well, <laughs> just in case. I didn't. Um, and this has been changing over the last uh, you know, five to eight years. And I think the Global Spending Watch is another tool that we'll be able to use much more fully, not only as, 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 as international NGOs, but more importantly in supporting the voice of, uh, of Southern civil society and their drive for the basic rights of their civilians and indeed for the communities themselves to speak up. Um, and the Global Spending Watch is basically an extraordinary tool for civil society to use, both to encourage and campaign <coughs> for governments to be far greater in transparency, in accountability, but also in the participation of poor people in the decisions that governments take every day that affect directly poor people's lives. So it's also, I think, important not just in its use, but also in the focus that it gives us. Because Oxfam believes that we're facing a, a a profound twin crisis, a crisis of extreme inequality and, of a, a, and an ecological crisis that interact intimately and will interact far more in the future. Um, and these disproportionately affect the poorest and most vulnerable people on our planet. Inequality, for instance, because there's enough food in the world for everyone to eat, and yet there's a billion people going to go to bed hungry tonight. There's another billion who are living with constantly with malnutrition. The ecological crisis, because The Guardian, amongst many others, reported only last Friday that we have passed that 400 parts per million uh, of carbon in the atmosphere, it, with enormous consequences in terms of extreme weather, but also in, in profound changes in the agricultural cycle and therefore the food security of poor people. What's interesting, though, is that Oxfam knows and sees every day the importance of public spending as, a, as, a, as central to the solutions that are necessary to these twin crises. And the Government Spending Watch monitors precisely those areas. So in terms of addressing the ecological crisis, you know, despite the MDGs relating directly to sustainable development and to reducing biodiversity loss, you see here it, you know, there are currently no global or regional targets or costings for environment and climate change spending. Most countries are spending less than 1% and the average is around 0.3%. That's scandalous in terms of the effort that's going in from government spending into environmental concerns that are a direct uh, impact on, on poor people's uh, lives. There's no sign of increased uh, environmental spending to match the rhetoric of, of Rio plus 20, and roughly half of the countries covered by government spending watch seen falls in environmental spending. Now for low-income countries, of course, emissions, carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions are completely trivial. But the vulnerability to climate shocks are immense, and they are the ones who are first and worst affected. So government spending on adaptation and, and on building resilience is key. Um, and you can see this from this chart, where the efforts by Bangladesh to really invest in disaster risk reduction has profoundly changed the situation from 1971, where 300,000 people died in a cyclone, through to the uh, intense cyclones of Sida, where only 3,000 died. Now, civil society right now has done a huge amount of effort in Bangladesh with support from Oxfam and other international NGOs to make sure that the, the latest develop the adaptation plan of the Bangladesh government has really uh, got poverty, the po uh, poor people, at its heart. Equally, we're working right now with civil society in Ethiopia to do exactly the same thing. 
we need this kind of financing information about where that money is going in order for those, uh, those civil society organisations in those countries to be able to hold those governments to account. We also know, of course, that there isn't the funding going into adaptation that's going to be necessary. Um, if we now move to extreme inequality, the billion people going to bed hungry tonight is not inevitable. There have been two just huge, two huge successes as examples here. They took diverse approaches <coughs> to, effect, to approaching uh, the en ending hunger, but both had government spending at their heart. So in Brazil, Brazil took basically one percent through a process of uh, uh, of redistribution. It took one percent of the income of the top ten percent of Brazil, one of the most unequal uh, countries in the world, and President Lula and the government distributed that to, to the bottom 20% with extraordinary implications in terms of hunger falling by a third in seven years in that country. In Vietnam, <laughs> they took a completely different approach. It was already a relatively equal country, but the government put its spending to build growth where poor people are in the Mekong and in the highlands, and particularly focusing on women, as women are the drivers of, of so much poverty reduction in those, in those communities. So again, that government spending was at the heart of those. Civil society was also at the heart of at least of Brazil, a little less in Vietnam for obvious reasons, but also a, a different form of civil society there it has been important. In terms of education, we, the report has good news, as you can see. 44 countries committed to 20% uh, of spending on education. 12 of them have, have already <coughs> reached it. 11% are, are very close, but 13% are spending less than 10%. On, the, on that work. That's why Oxfam, with so many civil society partners in, in West Africa, for instance, have major campaigns in many of those countries, including in Niger, with even the First Lady involved, to try and raise the education budget to achieve uni universal primary <coughs> education. Um, I'll skip that slide. So then, finally, uh, governments, uh, you know, Government Spending Watch is this tool to enhance the campaigning and advocacy work, particularly in developing countries. It empowers civil society. It helps us to be propositional about how governments can spend their money. It's much more into, easy to be propositional when you know what the government is already spending than just having to somehow dream up what you think they might be spending and then suggest what they might do if, the, if that is the truth. Um, so that kind of I I is extraordinarily important for us. But it's also important to say that this is a, this is a, this is a tool that is not only useful now for the MDGs, but is designed explicitly for it to be able to transfer into the post-MDG agenda. And that's why uh, Matthew and, uh, and his staff have made so much effort to make sure that also those environmental issues uh, feature strongly, the social protection issues will feature uh, very strongly. We needed this tool back in, uh, that back in the year 2000 so we could hold governments to account through the, uh, through the uh, process of the, of the MDGs. But DRI has provided an enormous service and it's an, I think it's a huge tribute to DRI that they've been able to get the confidence of governments and apply the extraordinary skills that they've got in handling data to provide this for us now. We are entering a new phase of extraordinary challenge in terms of ending poverty and suffering in both middle income states as well as in, in, in poor states, facing that twin crisis of extreme inequality and the ecological crisis, will which will interact far greater in the, in the coming years. Fortunately, this is a powerful tool which will help us address it. Thank you.